I'd like to introduce first uh, Nick Bilton, who would um, conduct this panel, who is a, a senior staff writer at the New York Times in uh, New York, and he's a foremost expert of the field of privacy and data and media. Um, author about I Live in the Future, his latest book, and here what, and the title is Here How It Works. We're very happy that Nick will introduce now the session, and we have the first two interventions um, he will now uh, bring to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So um, the, next, uh, the next 45 minutes or so are, are really going to uh, talk about privacy, um, and uh, I think we're, we're at a turning point for what privacy is um, as more and more data has been collected online, um, and, uh, and it's something that, that reaches a global, a global village, not just a European one or an American one. So um, I'd like to welcome uh, Dean uh, Hakamovich up uh, on stage. Um, who is uh, the uh, Corporate Vice President at Microsoft for the Internet Explorer. Um, Dean has been at Microsoft for 20 years. Um, he, uh, before he got involved in privacy and Internet Explorer, he actually um, has two claims to fame. Uh, the first is killing Clippy, the little Microsoft uh, Clippy note. That you, so we'll all give him a round of applause for that. And then the second, which is more important for a reporter like myself, is that he developed a little red squiggly line under um, uh, when you get uh, a word, you spell a word wrong. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, Dean's going to dis uh, discuss privacy and Internet Explorer. Thank you. So with, with all uh, due respect to the founder and doctor, I'd like to point out that there's something else that you can do at DLD that you cannot do uh, on Facebook, and that is stand up for a moment and stretch between all these, just stretch for a moment, I think we'll all feel a lot better. Yes? Okay, good. Another advantage for DLD. All right, thank you. It is, um, it is a delight uh, to uh, be in Bavaria uh, at DLD. Uh, identity and privacy are uh, very important topics. Uh, that Microsoft and clearly many others uh, take quite seriously. The discussion today uh, shows just how consistent the support uh, in helping consumers protect their privacy is. Uh, now, of all the privacy issues uh, that you hear discussed, being tracked as you browse the web is the one that comes up most consistently. Uh, Vice President of the European uh, Commission, uh, Cruz, um, blogged earlier this week uh, on, on that topic. And a lot of the privacy discussions, oh, okay, a lot of the privacy, yes, no, I'm, I can keep going? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, and a lot of the discussions have to do with how you're tracked uh, across the web. Now, I want to, uh, to talk about three things. I'd like to talk about three things. <coughs> uh, first, I want to start with a demonstration. I want to start with a demonstration examples of tracking. Many people uh, are still surprised at how broad uh, some of these practices are, and they haven't seen them in action. Now, there's tension here because the, the tracking that enables personalization that some people love is also uh, behavior that uh, other people think creates privacy issues. So it'll be good to see examples. Uh, then, I'd like to highlight how protecting privacy requires several groups to work well together. Uh, then I'd like to show some progress that Microsoft is making in partnership uh, with uh, web standards bodies and other groups uh, in order to help people uh, stay in control of their own information and protect their own privacy. So first, uh, a demonstration and some examples of tracking on the web today. Why don't we start with something very basic, uh, social media and posting uh, some information about yourself. Now, the consequences of posting information are quite clear, and this is something you are in complete control of. Uh, the issue, as usual, is what other people do with it. So uh, there's a site called pleaserobme.com, and uh, it's a clever experiment. What they do is they look at your check-ins to see when it is that you check in geographically someplace which is not your home. And then they consolidate these, and they make it very easy for other people to rob you. Um, you can see some of the press responses to this. Uh, now Foursquare is um, useful for burglars, according to one headline. And are we all asking to be robbed? 
so that's, th that's just one example. Now there's something even more basic. Reading the newspaper. Reading the newspaper online. When you read the newspaper, or frankly any site, who can track you? Well, the only sites that can track you are sites that you visit. So the next question is, when you read the newspaper, what sites are you actually visiting? Well, I uh, went to a, a good German newspaper uh, uh, earlier this week, and I brought up the privacy report. And you see in this dialogue, it lists all the websites that I visited as part of visiting this page. Now, as you scroll through it, you'll see lots and lots of sites that are not uh, belonging to the newspaper itself, a lot of them. Uh, in fact, you'll see 14 uh, in total. Those are 14 unique sites, many, many more uh, individual items from across these 14 other sites. Now, the same is true with other sites. So here's uh, an, another uh, piece of German media. And it, this one actually has content from 15 unique other sites. Now, who can track you as you read the web? You know, many sites you may not be aware of. All right, so what are the consequences of doing this? Well, one of the consequences uh, is advertisements that follow you uh, from website to website. Now, um, this is a known, uh, known behavior, and the New York Times uh, wrote about it relatively recently. And this is a good time to point out that not all tracking uh, is necessarily bad tracking. And let me bring up uh, an example of Amazon. Um, so uh, I recently went up on Amazon, and I noticed these recommendations, and I thought this would be a great example of, uh, of, of this I idea. I have a relationship with Amazon. Amazon knows where I live. They send me packages. And so I have a relationship with them. They make recommendations to me. These are of great value. And the, the real question is, what about, well, what about all these sites that I don't have a relationship with? What if I could block them from getting my information? And I'll talk about that more in, in, in a moment. Um, so that's the web. But what about applications? Now is this, is all, i look to the technical folks. This is all working and, yes? It is, yes? What about applications? Um, uh, what about devices? Is it, I'm sorry, is it going out? Yes, oh good, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll be very calm now. I'm very, they, they have it all under control. Okay, so um, what about applications? What about devices? Well, devices, when they share information, can make uh, life a lot easier. For example, I read a newspaper article at my desk on my uh, personal computer, and then I want to continue reading the same article on my smartphone. If the devices talk to each other about me, well, my life gets a lot easier. At the same time, complexity, uh, the, the privacy gets a bit more complex. Um, now, let's, uh, let, me, uh, let me show you uh, another example with devices. Now, this, I need to be very careful not to knock over the water, is one of my devices. You see, it's a nice kind of tablet thing. And uh, let me just start using it a little bit, and uh, you'll see uh, another good example. So, I'll start, and uh, it's, a, it's a very touch-friendly device, so I'll start by logging in. I'll circle the nose and the tongue. See, it's a very, very cute thing. That's how you log in on a very touch-first device. Now, what you see here <coughs> is, a, is this nice game uh, called Cut the Rope. And I will go through, and you can see it, it looks very cute. There's this little creature inside. Uh, it's called an Omnom, is that right? This is the Omnom down here, it's green. And what I can do is I can just touch. And I, if I can get the Omnom to eat the candy, the Omnom is happy. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and just play a little bit. I, I'm gonna stop talking because this takes my concentration. So I'll touch there. I'll touch there. Okay, I'm gonna stop now while I'm ahead because I'm not very good at this game. Now, typically, <clears throat> when you think about, <clears throat> excuse me, when you think about um, uh, touch and you think about experiences like this that are very graphical, you think about applications, not websites. Actually, uh, this is a website. If you look down uh, at the bottom, you'll see it's at cutthe-rope.ie. And you can actually go with your device or computer to cutthe-rope.ie uh, and play this game using a mouse, if you'd like, uh, in your web browser. And you'll see up over here are the other tabs I've opened. Here's the DLD conference with all the speakers. I can go through and uh, look at uh, Amazon. I, I just closed it. Um, you can look at touch effects. So again, here's a page, and I'm going to be touching. Now, all of this is actually a web page. Again. This is a web page. I can bring up view source for the, the geeks of you who are in the audience. 
Now, what's the point of showing this? The point is that the boundary between apps and the web is getting less clear. And technology like HTML5 can do more for people in newer modern browsers like uh, Internet Explorer. Now, by the way, uh, this device here that I was, I was using is actually running Windows 8. And what's interesting about Windows 8 is uh, it's an ex it, it shows how uh, there's, a, there's a convergence ahead. Now, the same device uh, that can deliver what you want as a tablet can also deliver what you need from your PC. So this is actually, this device is also a full-blown Windows computer. And you'll see that there's uh, some, some icons on the side. I actually worked on the, on the talk and the presentation on this device uh, by attaching a keyboard to it. So <clears throat> again, what do we just see? There's broad technology convergence. And that has the potential uh, to make privacy even more complex. So let's go back to the slides now, please. All right, so we just saw some examples of tracking and some, some uh, examples of how the technology is advancing. Uh, this is a good time to talk about how uh, improving privacy on the web is going to take cooperation. Yes, it will take cooperation. So let me give a few examples of, uh, of the cooperation. Privacy uh, is a worldwide conversation. At the same time, it's intensely local. Uh, uh, Vice President Redding talked about this. For example, uh, the expectations and the sensibilities change almost dramatically country to country, continent to continent. Now, when you, <clears throat> when you, when you think about protecting, uh, when you think about protecting privacy and even making progress protecting privacy, it requires many different groups and many different forms of expertise. Governments have an extremely important role. They provide a legal framework. They provide law enforcement. Uh, Vice President Redding's work is a great example of this, uh, as is uh, what I mentioned before, the recent blog post from Vice President Cruz. Uh, similarly, in the United States government, uh, Commissioner Julie Brill of the Federal Trade Commission uh, has done some impressive work. Now, uh, consumer advocacy groups uh, are very important. Press, uh, entrepreneurs, writers, there are many examples in this room. Uh, all have important roles. Now, for the solutions to work across the web, standards bodies are quite important too. Okay, so in this context of what are examples and demonstrations, what kind of collaboration is necessary, let's take a look at a real world uh, approach that's actually driving some progress today that you can use. So, do you remember the newspaper example where you went to one site but there was content from all over that was coming together and was capable of tracking you? Well, what if you could block what the sites use to track you? You can do that. The approach is called tracking protection. Now, it's worth a moment to talk about a complementary technology. Do not track. Now, I bring this up because often they're mistaken for each other as technologies. Do not track is an honor system. So the consumer hopes that the site will actually honor the request to not be tracked. Now, what the site must actually do is still under discussion, as we've heard. And then who enforces it and how is also under discussion. These are very, very important discussions, um, but they are ongoing. And some people, in the short term at least, believe that uh, we need more. And tracking protection works today to enforce the specific user privacy preferences uh, that you choose. So uh, let's, let's look at a sample. Now on this page, you'll see there's a web page and I've moved down into the bottom right corner and you see two black dots. Now if you remember on the newspaper page, it wasn't clear what it was on that page that was tracking you. You had to go and root around in a dialogue. For this example, we've colored them in. The two black dots are the things that can track you around the web. In fact, we even put colored boxes around them to make them more obvious. I would be surprised if you can find a real page on the web that marks how clearly uh, it's tracking you across your browsing. Now what you do is you go to a page that offers tracking protection lists. Here's a sample. Uh, and you go through and you click on a link to add a list. And here you'll say, yes, I'd like to add a tracking protection list that blocks the known tracking pixels. And then after you add it, you'll see that the next time you come back to the page, those, those black squares are empty. They're empty because the content was actually blocked. That's how the technology works. 
Now, uh, this technology is available today. It's available now in Internet Explorer 9. It's been available for about nine months, and, and that's a good start. Um, the, the thing that's, the, the, you say it's a good start, well, what else do we need? Well, you heard some discussion about web standards. So here's a page from the W3C's website. This is the premier web standards body. And uh, we're working very closely with them to standardize the technology. It's great to see some browsers uh, engaged here. Uh, and we look forward to having more of the browsers uh, join. Now, this is very good too. But the key to progress is to get lists from local groups. Because local groups understand local privacy concerns. Now, when we first released Internet Explorer 9, uh, we had five tracking protection lists available. Now there are 20 worldwide from seven distinct groups. And uh, you can go to iegallery.com uh, if you'd like to, to, to try any of them. Uh, let me give one example. Uh, there's an organization called Easy List. It's an open community effort. Um, and they offer the Easy Privacy List. Now they offer this as a tracking protection list. It's been available for six months and they've had over 250,000 subscribers to it already. Uh, so there's a, there's a clear demand and a clear need. All right, uh, the momentum continues. Uh, later this week, ah, and I'm sorry, there's a comment that was significant enough that they actually wrote about it. Later this week, um, two privacy advocates, Simon Davis and uh, Alex Hanf, uh, will release three new tracking protection lists uh, for Europe. Uh, there's one in particular that's focused on protecting children, which I find quite exciting. All right, so I just want to wrap up. One, uh, we had a demonstration and examples of tracking. Uh, two, we talked about how important uh, it is uh, for different groups to cooperate and work together. And three, we talked about progress and real world progress in protecting uh, consumers and their privacy. The most important thing is moving the web forward. And privacy is another aspect like uh, performance or web standards. Uh, the key thing is how important it is to do it right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, uh, we have another talk from uh, uh, somebody, but, um, and then we have a panel. Um, so the next guest is Andrew Keen. Um, and <clears throat> Andrew's one of the dissenting voices in Silicon Valley. Um, he's not a Luddite uh, um, like some of the dissenting voices out there, but he's someone that has been uh, warning of the, the problems that we may see in the future around uh, social media and Web 2.0. Um, he's currently working on a new book titled Digital Vertigo, which comes out in June. Um, and um, it's going to be looking at what the, the cons of Facebook and Twitter and this social media world that we are entering and living in now uh, could look like. So I'd like to enter, um, have Andrew come up on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I feel like we're all bookends between um, Commissioner Redding, who kicked this event off, and of course, the lady who's going to finish it all off, Sheryl Sandberg, the uh, number two woman at, at Facebook. Uh, and as bookends, I think we have to negotiate perhaps a compromise between these two worlds. I listened to Commissioner Redding, and I've got bad news for you, I'm afraid. You probably already need it. You know it. You don't need me to tell you. But I'll tell you anyway. I'm going to give you a quote from Sheryl Sandberg, who wrote a very interesting piece about um, the future in, uh, thank you, in, um, in The Economist in November, their 2012 edition. I'm going to read it because I think it's really important. She says, or she wrote, expressing our authentic identity will become even more pervasive in the coming year. Profiles will no longer be outlines. Whoops. Um, Profiles will no longer be outlines, but detailed self-portraits of who we, really, who we really are. Do you all know who you really are? Anyone want to stick up their hand if they have an idea of their authentic identity? But detail, I'm going to repeat that, but detailed self-portraits of who we really are. Uh, Commissioner Redding must be squirming in her seat. 
including, and this is what she says, the books we read, the music we listen to, the distances we run, the places we travel, the causes we support, the videos of cats we laugh at. Does anyone here actually laugh at cat videos? I certainly don't. Our likes and our links. And yes, and this is the killer sentence, and this is where we are bookends between Commissioner Redding and Sheryl Sandberg. And yes, this shift to authenticity will take getting used to and will elicit cries of lost privacy. Now, I'm here as a crier. I'm here as someone who is raising my voice in defense of lost privacy, although I'm not necessarily convinced that uh, Commissioner Redding's strategy is the most effective one because politics and politicians in America and in Europe uh, lag behind technologists. They lag behind Silicon Valley. And as Nick so kindly said, I'm an inside critic. I'm here from Silicon Valley, and I'm here to tell you what's really going on, if I can figure out how to use this thing. Um, whoops. So what's really going on here? I call it Digital Vertigo. That's the title of my upcoming book in June. That will be the first and last uh, pitch for that book. I like to, when I think about the future, I like to work off the fictional Sean Parker's quotation in the social, contra in the social network, social contract being a Freudian slip, of course. It's not the social contract, it's the social network. The fictional Sean Parker was sniffing some cocaine from a young lady's chest, uh, in the movie at least, and uh, telling the world what was going on. He said, first we lived on farms, then we lived on cities, and now we're going to live on the internet. And I think this is a fundamental reality, like it or not, for better or worse, we are indeed living on the internet. Now, as Yossi says, you can't rub noses on Facebook, although I'm sure there are some people who try. But we are living on the internet. The old Web 2.0 age of second life has changed into the Web 3.0 world of an internet of people. That is a very, very important phrase. The, real, the so-called real world and the so-called virtual world have come together. They can't be separated. They are inseparable, and those are the fundamental cultural, political, economic, and sociological realities of the 21st century. So what's going on? I think the most articulate spokesperson for this revolution is Reid Hoffman. Reid Hoffman basically invented the social web. He is the preeminent entrepreneur as the founder of LinkedIn, of social media, but he's also the primary investor. New York Times called him the king of connectors. Hoffman also invented, he didn't invent the phrase, but he's the first guy to actually define what Web 3.0 means. He said, real identities generating massive amounts of data. And that is the reality of the world that Commissioner Redding is dealing with, the world that many of us are profiting from, the world that I have just written about. Real identities generating massive amounts of data. It's a fundamental cultural revolution, much larger, much more profound than Web 2.0. John Doerr describes social as the third great wave of technological innovation after the invention of the personal computer and the internet. Social these real identities generating massive amounts of data is everywhere and everything. It's driving innovation in Silicon Valley. It is the thing that's creating value. And we are bookends between Commissioner Redding and Sheryl Sandberg because, of course, Sheryl running the show. Sheryl and Mark are the innovators. They're the people who are defining the agenda with timeline and social graph and everything else. So, I've never actually tried this before. I'm going to do something technologically sophisticated. These are the examples of social companies. There are many more. My web designer could only fit this amount on. Every Look at that. Isn't that impressive? If I can do that, anyone can. Culture the amateur. Um, everything in Silicon Valley is going social. We all know about Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter as agencies of great personal data, but enterprises going social, 
GroupMe, SoundCloud, Music Social. Uh, there's this one called Cycle Meter. Is Scoble here? I know he's in the building somewhere. He's probably on his Cycle Meter. Cycle Meter is a service in Silicon Valley which, if you enter, reveals where you are on your bicycle. There are, of course, location services from Facebook, from GoWala, which just got acquired by Facebook, uh, by, Four, by Foursquare. Everything is going social, from education to politics to culture to music to journalism to television. The network that we are creating, the 50 billion intelligent objects that are supposed to exist in our hand by 2020 in this post-PC world, is all going social. Now, Commissioner Redding may not like to hear this, but it's true. We are willingly going on this network to express ourselves, to tell the world where we're bicycling to, to go on Facebook, to introduce and invent our own timeline. We are revealing ourselves on this network. No one's forcing us to do it. We're not doing it against our own will. This data then is, as Commissioner said, our currency of this new world. It's a currency that's defining us, driving us. It's a currency that's getting us jobs increasingly in a free agent nation. It is the thing that we use to build ourselves, to build our brands. So we can't be conservatives and want to go back to an old world. But at the same time, I think, and I'm, on, I'm in Commissioner Redding's camp here, we have to realize the dangers of this new world. Oh, look at that. I think the biggest danger, in my view, is fighting what I call the cult of the social. My friend Jeff Jarvis is in the front row, or second front row. He is one of the, the world's, I think, most articulate and persuasive uh, advocates of the cult of the social, the idea that we should reveal ourselves, the idea that technology now, technology is reinventing ourselves. Technology is allowing us to become social, to find ourselves. I think that's a mistake. I think we've fallen into the seduction, the idea that we want to be social. I don't believe that we are necessarily or naturally social. I'm against Aristotle's idea. I'm against the idea that Sheryl Sandberg peddles that authenticity is what we want and that radical transparency is defining us as human beings. There are profound problems in this world. There are profound problems when we are revealing ourselves on this increasingly ubiquitous and omnipresent network. You don't need to tell me about big data and big brother. Commissioner Redding is here as a representative of big government. Now, I'm not necessarily scared of the European Commission, but as Eugenie Morozov has shown, we do need to be very, very nervous about the Russian government, the Chinese government, the Iranian government, and their use of social media. It's no coincidence in this world that the Iranians and Chinese have both passed a law this month in which forces people to reveal themselves on social networks. Above all else, I think the privacy problem in terms of enterprise is that we've become the product. In networks like Facebook, which are free, we are selling ourselves. Their only way of making a profit is selling our data. They would never acknowledge that, and Sheryl Sandberg, of course, would never acknowledge that. But that's a truth. That's a reality. There is no voodoo economics here. If you're not charging, if you're selling your advertising services on your network and you're becoming more and more intimate through this personalized data, then the only way you can become profitable is by turning your users into products. More and more people are realizing that. But perhaps the biggest danger, the thing I most fear, is ourselves. This network is not a 20th century top-down network. It reflects the distributed nature of the internet. It's a democratic kind of totalitarianism. We as little brothers then are the collective big brother of the 21st century. Now there are lots of solutions. Commissioner Redding, I think, is very hot on solutions, and I hope that some of her solutions are actually imported into the US. 
One obvious solution is simply resisting. I've become a Facebook resistor. I'm not on the network, but I am on Twitter because one has to be. So ultimately, what is my solution? I would like in the collective cult of the social in the 21st century to rehabilitate solitude. Since we're in Germany, I can quote Nietzsche. I wouldn't do this if I was in America or England. But Nietzsche's famous response to Aristotle from his Twilight of the Idols, he said, in order to live alone, one must be an animal or a god, said Aristotle. The third case is missing. One must, one must be both a philosopher. That's the challenge for all of us collectively in this increasingly well-lit dormitory that Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg have built in the 21st century. We need to become philosophers. We need to learn how to live alone. We need to re-embrace solitude. It doesn't mean that we lock ourselves in a room forever, but it does mean that this radical transparency that has collectively crept up on us needs to be pushed back on. And it won't be done by government, because government is old-fashioned. It can only be done by us. We are the builders of the internet, this network. We are the ones who will civilize it, manage it, settle it, and make it habitable for a world that will become increasingly digital in the 21st century. Thank you. So I'd like to invite the panelists up um, for the, the next session of this privacy debate. So you guys all have mics. Um, so uh, let's just go down the line and you want to introduce yourselves very quickly about 30 seconds, 20 seconds of who you are. Stefan Grosselbeck, I'm the CEO of Xing. Xing is um, Europe's leading uh, social network for professionals. We're based in Hamburg, about 10 million members. I'm Chris Poole. I founded a community called 4chan about eight and a half years ago. It's the largest, or one of the largest uh, anonymous message boards on the internet. And most recently, I've been working on a new project called Canvas. Hi, my name is Sebastian Nerz. I'm the chairman of the Pirate Party Germany. So um, we've, been, we've heard from three different people so far about privacy and the internet. And we're, we, you know, one of the things that the commissioner said was that um, the, the rules that apply today date back to 1995. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a movement in America to bring new privacy legislation. There's a movement in Europe or around the world. But my question is, is it too late? Is privacy already dead? Do you want to start with that? Um, so, uh, I don't think at all that privacy is dead. Uh, actually, I think it's, it's, it's absurd to think that privacy is dead. I mean, ask anyone in the room whether, you know, everybody in this room would be willing to share every single of his personal secrets with everybody else in this room. And I think, obviously, the answer is, is, is no. So, so, I don't think privacy dead, is dead. Having said that, our concept of privacy has, has changed because with technology changing, our ability you know, to share stuff with other people has, you know, gotten to totally new heights, uh, you know, new ways of doing this uh, with a higher reach, higher sophistication of sharing, sharing things. And so we have to think about concepts, new concepts, legal concepts, general concepts, how we deal with, you, you know, these new possibilities we have. But I don't think at all privacy is dead. And all research we do indicates it's not dead. Chris? No, I don't think it's it either. I mean, I agree with Stefan as far as, right, I mean, the, the perception of what, what constitutes privacy has, has changed. Uh, and obviously, we're now much more comfortable sharing all these kind of intimacies of our life, uh, you know, as we compared to 10 years ago. Um, but no, I don't think it's dead yet. Well, th there was a there was a, uh, a study that was done in a poll that was done um, in America, um, asking people um, about Facebook and privacy, and uh, and I think 50% said they they don't trust Facebook, but yet they said that they would not would not cancel their account. So, uh, you know, what, what's the the answer to that? Well, the concept was what is privacy, what should be kept private, are changing. Uh, for the first time in history, we have the possibility to talk about ourselves with a great, uh, with a great public. And uh, I think that many people are underestimating how public they are in social networks. It's kind of like talking to a friend if you're posting something on Facebook or Xing. 
And uh, this is a concept that first has to be learned by the people. But uh, saying that privacy is dead, no, it is not. It's changing. Um, people are not posting their intimacies, they're not posting their secrets, they're not posting things they would not discuss with their friends. Privacy is changing. And for the first time in history, f we f have to discuss what privacy is. And uh, in its absolute, it's a decision everybody has to take for himself. Now we have the possibility to decide for ourselves yeah, what but, is private. But, but everyone doesn't, doesn't know what happens to their personal data online. You know, most people have no concept of that. Um, so, 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 which leads me to, to another question. Um, you know, who, who's responsible for, for protecting consumers? Is it, is it a consumer's responsibility? Is it the government's responsibility? Is it company's responsibility? Um, who do you think that, that should, be, should be behind, um, you know, ensuring that people's private information um, is being kept private? Well, a company has to say what um, they are doing with data. They have to tell me, if you are clicking delete, is this data really deleted or do we keep a copy of it? Uh, and the government has to enforce that, those, that this data transparency is ensured. That uh, companies are not using data for um, purposes I have not agreed to. But the customer, the, the person publishing data, has to make sure that he or she wants to publish the data. And, and fundamentally, I believe that there is sort of in the longer term, there's no fundamental conflict here between companies and, and say, regulators. Because ultimately, I do believe that, um, you know, you need trust with your customers in order to have a successful, stable business. And so ultimately, companies have an interest uh, to, to build this trust. Having said that, there is obviously, you know, enormous discussion about you know about what what the right what the right regulation is, and so I want to point out, if I may, uh, one point which which the commissioner made today, which I found uh, very strong and very important, and that is that she is committed to, for the first time, creating a level playing field uh, for companies across Europe and beyond Europe uh, to to compete on a level playing field because we don't have that today. As of today, there's actually no level playing field uh, because uh, companies um, you know outside Europe particularly American companies, can actually compete in Europe uh, without having to comply with local laws. And as a result, and this is legal, by the way, it's a current system. And as a result of that, have competitive advantages versus local players. So I appreciate uh, the, the commitment of actually creating a level playing field which covers European companies, but frankly, everybody who offers services to any consumer in Europe. I think that's a very important point and should be implemented as fast as possible. I think it's important, though, to kind of separate anonymity and privacy into kind of the front end and the back end, though. Uh, and on the front end you have is, you know, how you appear to others on a service, um, how you're identified to other users. And that, I would say, is kind of more up to the users and the service provider. Uh, and then there's the back end, which is, um, you know, like your, your personal identifiable, personally identifiable information, your IP, stuff like that. Uh, and that'll probably be left up to the regulators. So uh, I have a question for Chris to start with, but um, <clears throat> one of the, the dis debates that has happened this year with Google Plus and Twitter and Facebook has been, um, should people be allowed to be anonymous online? Uh, should we enable anonym uh, anonymity? And one of the arguments uh, for it is that people could, you know, if, if I'm anonymous, I can be a part of a discussion that I don't necessarily want people to know about. Maybe it's um, something political, it's something health related. Uh, but one of the, the, the cons of that is that people can then go into message boards and onto websites and say things that are vitriolic and mean and so on. Um, should we allow anonymity on the web? And if so, how do we do it in a responsible way? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I made the argument uh, back in October that, I mean, essentially, like the, you know, all of the service providers now, like Google and Facebook, are trying to um, kind of consolidate identity into this one concept that is your, you know, your real true identity, you know, full legal name, you know, picture of your face. Uh, and that instead, you know, p because we're all very multifaceted individuals, there are kind of many concepts of our own personal identity. And so the ability to contribute anonymously or, you know, pseudo-anonymously using a handle um, is really key to, I mean, how humans express themselves in real life. And, um, uh, and they should be able to do so online. Um, I mean, I think that's, again, like something that's kind of up to the users, though, to, to kind of, you know, we, we need to cherish uh, that. And I think it's something that my concern is that um, we're kind of being very, you know, obviously, like, comfortable and kind of complacent with the kind of Facebook status quo. Uh, and that's why I've tried to, like, push back, not to say that everybody should be anonymous online, but that, you know, having options is uh, always a good thing. 
for me, that's one of those examples where we should really leave it to sort of the market and consumers and companies to figure that out. You know, you know, if, if there is demand for products where people browse anonymously, well, there will be products where you can, or services where you can browse anonymously, and there are services where you browse anonymously. And then there are other services, including the one I represent, where it just makes no sense uh, to enable to browse anonymously because, you know, having a real identity with you actually is the whole point of being in that context. So that's one of those points where, you know, really it should be up to users to choose the service they're interested in and then act accordingly. Let's not get, let's not get into the idea of having to turn this into a general rule where all companies or all services have to offer either one or the other or both. I think it makes no sense. Anonymi anon oops. <laughs> being able to be anonymous is uh, one of the key points for a democracy. You cannot have a real freedom of speech without the possibility to be anonymous. Because freedom of speech means that you are able to tell your opinion without fear of uh, um, repression. And this is only possible in the extreme if you are anonymous. So you have to keep the possibility to be anonymous on the internet. One of the, the greatest problems with this has been shown in the previous um, speech here are those tracking cookies users don't know about because they are, of course, able to identify people. And um, I would agree that the service has to decide for itself whether users um, are allowed to be anonymous or not, with one exception. If this service is uh, going to be um, some kind of, um, of obligation for the users. Like for example, Facebook is for many students because universities are starting to um, prepare their courses on Facebook. Then users have to use Facebook and then you have to provide the possibility to be anonymous. The so so if, you, if you ran Facebook, would you, let's just say that Mark Zuckerberg hires you and he steps down, uh, would you allow an anonymity on, the, on, the, on Facebook or, or, or not? Yes. You would? Would you, Chris? I would. And you? So uh, The dissent. So <laughs> the, the big question behind is at what point does a particular service turn into a sort of an infrastructure of the web? And once you, you know, once it is clear it has become part of the infrastructure, what does that actually mean, right? And do we need, you know, do we put, need to put on rules on infrastructure? That's an interesting debate. I think that's, that's what behind this. So I think it's the right thing to leave this up to Mark Zuckerberg. At the same time, you know, you know, we have infrastructures in certain, in, you know, all areas of the economy, and there are certain rules which apply to them, and we should think about what that means for the web. Well, we, we left a lot up to Mark Zuckerberg, and, and, and things didn't work out so well. Uh, you know, the FTC he, he, he had to disagree get, with that. Well, uh, the FTC had to get involved recently and um, and put legislation um, o over them and oversight. Uh, and um, and a lot of customers were pretty unhappy with the way that their privacy was dealt with on Facebook. Um, so I, I don't know if I agree with leaving leaving things up to, to the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world to fig to figure it out and to protect consumers because it's in their best interest to uh, to put data online and put advertising next to it. I, I think they'll have to change eventually. I mean, it's interesting to think about. I mean, if you ask Mark what Facebook is, I mean, he, or he's in the past, it's, it's an identity platform, right? And they're becoming the kind of, you know, social plumbing for the web. And it'll be interesting to see how that, um, you know, kind of scales outside of Facebook. I mean, maybe Facebook as a destination, uh, it makes sense, uh, you know, similar to your network, to, to be identified by your full name and, you know, because you're, you have all these relationships on it. But um, I think what's interesting is to think about how Facebook Connect will scale outside of Facebook, where um, that's where I can imagine them being more flexible with allowing people to, uh, authenticate using Connect, but uh, participate using an alias or anonymously. I mean, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah, and, and I'll make a comment from a sort of European point of view. Um, the legislation or the regulation which Mark Zuckerberg is subject to is nothing compared to the uh, legislation and, reg and, and, and a regulation which I am subject to. Okay, so we're coming from a very, very different starting point here. And so I don't really, I really don't want to be misunderstood in terms of I'm asking for more regulation. Um, what I'm asking for is, is, it's always easy to say that, but I'm asking for some smarter regulation because w in, in my conversations with regulators, what I often see, and I'm actually not including the commissioner in, in this point of view I'm about to make, but what, what I often see is, you know, people don't understand that data is the oil of the 21st century. You talk to regulators and they, they don't get the point. The, the, for them, the point about data is it's something scary. It's something you know, which needs protection. It's something which needs to be regulated. And 
I don't disagree that that's true, but what I miss is all people understand to oil too. I'm sorry. They all apply to oil too. I think if you're using that analogy. Well, but, yeah, but the but the well, but oil isn't oil certainly isn't as regulated as as, as data is, right? And the point I'm but the point I'm making is, you know, data is today is at the origin of a whole series of new products and new services being used by you know millions and millions of people worldwide and actually making the world a better place, if you will. And as we regulate data, which we do, which we have to continue to do, we have to keep that in mind. It's not mainly about protection and risk and bad things. It's about opportunity, building new products and services and making the world a better place. And I miss a lot of that thinking when I talk to local regulators. So um, I think that's, that's, from my point of view, very, very important to keep in mind as we think about new ways of you know, regulating our privacy in so, Europe. So uh, speaking of the regulation, um, uh, I covered uh, the Sony hacking that happened last year. Uh, and Sony was hacked probably a couple of dozen times. Um, there was 77 million people's personal and private information that was stolen um, and released onto the web. Uh, and one of the problems was that Sony was using outdated servers, they let go half of their security team and so on, um, and the end result was that there was no regulation to hold Sony accountable. They never got in any kind of trouble, um, there, there was nothing that happened. And, and so there's two arguments to this. One, should there be government regulations that says if you have X, Y, and Z kind of data that you have to use these kinds of servers and these kinds of rules to, to protect consumers. Um, but then the, the, the argument to that and that I've heard from people at Facebook and Twitter and so on is that if you have these regulations that we can't innovate as quickly and so on. Um, so do you, do you think that it's the government's responsibility or do you think that it's the, the company's responsibility? You want to start? Basically, basically, it's about trust. Users have to trust the company they are uh, giving the data. And uh, of course, if a company is uh, not investing enough in security, if those servers are hacked, if uh, data is copied, uh, users will not trust the company anymore. So it would theoretically be in the, in the best uh, effort of the company to do as much as possible for security. But we have seen that many companies um, are not thinking this through, that they are investing not enough money, that they are uh, very, um, that they are handling personal data in a, in a way that's not very good for the customers. And uh, if this is the case, then the government has to start regulating. This does not mean that they have to uh, give uh, opinions which machines to use, which software to use. Uh, um, I'm going to interrupt you because we're running out of time. I want to hear okay. from uh, these guys 30 seconds each on, on this. I, going with the oil analogy, I would love to see some regulations that would, would hold a company like Sony accountable in the way that we held BP accountable for the you know Gulf oil spill. Um, <laughs> you know, in in the in the in you know in terms of like gross negligence. I mean, in the case of Sony, I mean, you know, in, you know every now and then a company will be hacked, you know, despite best practices. But in the case of Sony, I mean, you know, they messed up and yeah. they deserve to be, I think, punished for it. How could it not be Sony who is primarily responsible for having the right equipment in place and making sure the data is protected? And guess what? Sony has suffered badly from not having been able to do it. I mean, we're sitting here debating Sony's failure in data protection. Yep. That's a horrible problem for Sony. Yep. So I'm actually quite hopeful that, you know, it's again market forces which force companies to, to upgrade their systems. And I'm certain Sony has made significant investments to make sure these things never happen again. So there, there's no question they're responsible. And if regulators try to go that deep and in terms of making sure things go safely, they will fail because there's no way for them to be sort of up to, be up to speed on what's possible technology-wise. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our privacy hour and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.